Our scripture this morning comes from Galatians, uh, the fifth chapter, verses 13 through 14. And it's, uh, it's rather short. And it says, you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only don't let this freedom be an opportunity to indulge your selfish impulses, but to serve each other through love. All the love has been fulfilled in a single statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. So ends the reading of our word, the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Well, you know, the God of all creation loves you with a crazy love. And how do we re respond many times to that love? Many times it's with a half-hearted, lukewarm attempts of signs of affection. And we talked about that last week. If we truly want to be in love with God, we have to give of ourselves completely. But how can we do that? We get so distracted by the things of this world, by our own desires, our needs, and the stress of life that we cannot ever seem to be completely in love with God. But you know, there is good news. So today we are going to talk about how to enter into a lasting relationship with God through Jesus Christ. And it may just change your life. Now let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in love? Have you ever been desperately in love? Maybe you still are. I mean... Think about what that feels like. You know, I remember the early days of Karen and I, my relationship. You know, I would do anything to make her happy. I would watch drag racing with her dad. I'd attempt to eat some of the fa her favorite things to eat. And I didn't actually resist falling in love because I knew that once I gave in to that crazy little thing called love, there was no turning back. I knew I would lose myself. And that is what happened. I mean, we've been together for almost 37 years, and my thoughts still linger on her. How to make her happy. How to love her more. You know, quite honestly, I miss her when she's at work. I miss her if I'm gone for any length of time. You know, when I first moved down here two years ago, I was here and she was still in Rockford, and I look forward to Sunday when I finished the benediction, I went to the parsonage to change clothes, and I drove back to Rockford to spend a few days with her. See, I'm in desperately in love with my wife, Karen. Now, I didn't mean to sicken you with that sappy testimony, but I wanted you to think about being in love and the crazy and stupid things we do sometimes to remain there. Now, think of your relationship with God. How have you desperately sought to be in love with God? I mean, I love my wife, she loves me, but our love is imperfect. Definitely, we get frustrated and upset, and we get distracted and stressed out over things, but we love each other just the same. Now think of God. God who knows every hair on your head and loves you perfectly and who loves never fails. See, God desperately sought you out. So how have you responded to that kind of love? There was a Spanish Carmelite uh, nun named Teresa of Villa who lived during the mid-1500s. And you know, there's some inter interesting trivia about the day she died. 
You know, St. Teresa is that she died the day that the Catholic Church in Europe adopted the Gregorian calendar over the Julian calendar. And this change necessitated to eliminate nine days from the calendar. So they would coincide. So she, since Teresa of Avila died on that day, she actually died on October 5th through the 14th of 1582. But in this quote, she, spokes of, she speaks of being in love with God, and it's like this. First, there is a self-forgetfulness, which is so complete that it really seems as though that the soul, soul no longer exists, because it is such that you have neither knowledge nor remembrance, that there is either a heaven or life or honor for yourself, so entirely are you employed in seeking the honor of God. And so, happen what may, you do not mind in the least, but live in so strange a state of forgetfulness that you seem to no longer exist and have no desire to exist. None. Absolutely none. Save when you realize that you can do something and advance the glory and the honor of God for which you have gladly laid down your life. Think about those words. It sounds a lot like falling in love. So, how can we start falling in love with God? You know, last week we talked about living as lukewarm followers of Jesus. But my intention was not to make you feel get bad or guilty or guilt you into working harder to be better. Because actions driven by fear and guilt will not cure our lukewarm states. Only love will. See, God desires us to desire him but only through love. You know, our scripture this morning from Galatians 5, Paul is reminding us that love frees us, gives us this freedom. You know, there's 613 commandments in the Old Testament, but when we love, we don't have to worry about them because when you love, you cannot sin. Because love and sin cannot coexist. See, Paul writes earlier in verse 6 that the only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. So is loving God and loving others what you're all about? Is that what a Christian means to you? Do you live as though faith demonstrated through love is the only thing that really matters? You know, when many, several years ago, we started a church up in Mitchesney Park called New Life. New Life United Methodist Church. And we had a theme song. You know, every church should have a theme song. You know, an anthem, a fight song. And that song was called We Are Free, and it's by a husband and wife worship leaders. Uh, they're called Brad and Rebecca. And the lyrics of the chorus, the pre-chorus of that song, are, There is no one who is greater than our God, our King, who sent his Son to save us. He brought liberty. Death no longer has a hold. Our chains have been released. We are free. Oh, 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 oh. we are free. Oh, 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 oh. And I could still see people in that church when we got to that. We are free. Oh, 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 oh. we are free. 
But you, but are you living that joyous freedom that we have in Christ? Does your relationship with God bring you peace, hope, joy, and love in the ways that you've never experienced? See, most of my life, my relationship with God didn't do those things. I think most people have the same experience. So why then is it so hard to be in love with God? Why is it so hard to love others? And why is it so hard to be truly, to truly feel free? You know, let's take a moment and listen to the lyrics of another song written about our desire for God. And it says, God, my God, it's you. I search for you. My whole being thirsts for you. My, my body desires you. In a dry and tired land, no water anywhere. Yes, I've, been, I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've seen your power and glory. My, my lips praise you because your faithful love is better than life itself. So I will bless you as long as I'm alive. I will lift my hands in your name. See, that song was written roughly 3,000 years ago. It's actually Psalm 63 from our Bible. And in it, a person just like you and me desperately sought God. So how can we do the same? How can we grasp onto what that author of the psalm had, a relentless passion for God? You know, the simple solution is we try harder. If we fell in love with someone and they didn't return that love, you may try harder to impress them. You may show them more signs of affection, do things to show them how much you love them. You may spend day or night trying to prove that love to them. But if we do that with God, we will inevitably fail because God is way out of our league. We also can't will ourselves to love God more. If we believe loving God is an obligation, it won't truly be the kind of love that brings freedom. In truth, it won't be love at all. It'll just be service. And God's true intent for us is not to be only servants. So if hard work isn't the answer, what is? See, God wants to change us. He wants to help us love more. In the Gospel of John, the 10th chapter, verse 10, it says, I came that you may have life and have it to the full. I mean, church is, or should be, all about experiencing new life and sharing that new life with others. But you cannot do it alone. You need God's help to experience new life. In fact, you need God's help to love God more. Why is that? It's the same reason that you cannot sin if you love, because God is love. We think that love is some kind of emotion or a combination of emotion and feelings, but love is something we control, or sub love isn't something we control. The love of God is an amazing thing. The more you ask for love, the more you ask God to change you. The more love you receive and the more you change, which calls you to pray for more love and to live new life in its fullness. This is a wonderful cycle which grows in us and challenges us. It is a cycle that only ends when we experience union with God. And even then, we still need more of God. Because without God, each of us has certain, only a certain capacity for love. But with God, our cup overflows 
and our plate runs over. But God's love is perfectly infinite. It's like in those movies when two lovers are in a field and and the sun is glistening and their hair is flowing in the breeze and they're, they're running in slow motion towards each other for that embrace. See, when we desire to be in love with God, we have to act exactly like that. We need to run towards him with our arms open. And the good news is that as long as you are running towards God, you are freed from sin because you can't be focused on God and sin at the same time. You cannot love God and sin simultaneously. The only way to sin is to stop running towards God, turn around, and head the other way. As long as you are running towards God, you are free to serve, love, give thanks without fear, guilt, or worry. As long as you are running, you are safe. But when you run... You get exhausted. Running is exhausting, isn't it? When we aren't used to running towards God, or if we are only used to running out of fear or guilt, we will have to stop. And when we stop running, we are in danger of turning away from God. So we have to train ourselves. We have to train ourselves through prayer, through devotion, through Bible study, through worship through service, through giving, witnessing, and ultimately loving others. So only God knows. I mean, you can fool me and others when it comes to your relationship with God, but you know, you can't fool God. God knows how much you love him. Whether you are asking for new life or not, so be honest. Be honest with God. Tell God how you feel. Tell God where you are. And don't make excuses. Don't rationalize. Speak plainly with God and ask for more love. So you will desire more love and ultimately experience more love in its complete fullness. For my closing prayer, I I, I actually want to read a scripture because I think it gives us everything in here about love. It comes from the first epistle of John, the fourth chapter, and it's verses 7 through 21. And it says, love and God. And John says, dear friends, let's love each other because love is from God and everyone who loves is born from God and knows God. The person who doesn't love does not know God because God is love. This is how the love of God is revealed to us. God has sent his only son into the world so that we can live through him. This is love. It is not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice that deals with our sins. So dear friends, if God loves us this way, we also ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God. If we love each other, God remains in us and his love is made perfect in us. This is how we know we remain in him and he remains in us because he has given us a measure of his spirit. We have seen and testified that the father has sent his son to be the savior of the world. And if any of us confess that Jesus is God's son, God remains in us and we remain in God. We have known and have believed the love that God has for us because God is love and those who remain in love remain in God and God remains in them. This is how love has been perfected in us so that we may have the confidence on judgment day because we are exactly the same as God is in this world. There is no fear in love 
but perfect love drives out fear because fear expects punishment. The person who is afraid and not been made perfect in love, we love because God loved us first. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. After all, those who don't love their brothers and sisters, whom, whom they have seen, can hardly love God, whom they have not seen. This commandment we have from him, those who claim to love God ought to love their brothers and sisters also. See, I'm so grateful that we have the entirety of Scripture. But I believe if all I had was this passage, it would be enough. Because it pretty much sums up the gospel for us. Love comes from God because God is love. And that part of you that can love that is the image of God in you. If you have ever loved, it is only because God lives in you. Even if you haven't let him in completely, that is why everyone can do good some of the time. But when you let God take over your life, you can experience love in entirely new and wonderful ways. Amen. Well, Christ our Lord invites us to his table, all that love him and who earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sins before God and for one another. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Oh, uh, lift up your heart. Uh, let us give thanks to the Lord our God. As the sun sets earlier, the days become cooler. And the crops near the harvest, we celebrate the plentitude of fruits available to us. We acknowledge the ways that we can use our gifts to care for our siblings in need. We extend this table through the work of our hands and the mission of this church. And as we celebrate this sacrament, may we remember the laborers in the fields, the harvesters of the wheat and the grapes, the transporters of their yields, those who transform wheat into bread and, and grapes into juice. Bless their hands and the feet as they labor at the farms and the gardens. In trucks and warehouses, we give thanks for the ones who prepare the table here today. May their gifts be a, a preparation and hospitality inspire us to extend hospitality to the strangers among us. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn. After laboring on the streets of Jerusalem, doing justice, loving kindness and walking humbly with God. Jesus clutched bread in his hands. He blessed the food. He gave thanks and heartily expressed to his friends that this was the bread of life. As you eat this bread, remember me. And after supper, Jesus grasped the cup filled with the gifts of the vine. And in his blessing, he reminded them, whenever you drink of this cup, remember me. And so in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ 
spirit of wisdom and wonder and, and win, pour out for all that are gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. May they stir us from the stagnation and active, uh, actively loving God, our neighbors, and ourselves. And may our participation at this table transform us into the people God is calling us to be. By your spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry of all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, your done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now with gratitude we gather at this table. We take a piece of bread that has been broken for you. Then we take the juice, signifying his blood, the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now let us remember the grace that is poured out from God. And I had asked Alyssa and Serafina, did you want to come up and help? Communion? Uh, we'll, yeah, we'll go down on the floor. Here. Tell you what, let me stand in between you. The table is ready. The meal is served. Come. Steve, the body broken for you. Alta, the body broken for you. Dan, the body broken for you. Kayla, the body broken for you. Lysandra, the body broken for you. Benoni, the body broken for you. Carolyn, the body broken for you. Oh. Oh. Oh, yeah. yeah. Courtney, the body broken for you. Beth, the body broken for you. Gary, the body broken for you. Ruth, the body broken for you. Oops. Kenny, the body broken for you. John, the body broken for you. Okay. Pat, the body broken for you. Oops. Dwayne, the body broken for you. Green, the body broken for you. the body broken for you. Mark, the body broken for you. Uh, let's go over and... Tony, the 
body broken for you. And Serafina, the body broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And Alyssa, the body broken for you. Body broken for you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this act of love you, you give us through the sharing of bread and juice at your table. Continue to be with us and to inspire us to ask for more love from you because you are love. And when we ask for that love from you, we can't help but have our cup overflow to love others as ourselves. Amen.